I am back. Take zero. All right, so as you guys may have probably noticed, um, there hasn't been a new video, like a, just a purely um, new content um, on the YouTube channel, actually, or at IoT.University in uh, maybe a, five weeks, six weeks, something in that neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> at the end of this video, I'm going to kind of explain where I was, but basically I got uh, – I had a medical emergency, and I have just – since recovered from it i'll kind of explain that whole thing um at the end the, even those of you who are following where i gave the updates on twitter and linkedin uh, i'll give more detail and i'm actually gonna kind of draw a the importance of i'm going to use what i went through to illustrate the importance of digital transformation for our daily lives um, and how digital transformation impacted me uh, while i was in the hospital uh, all the tests all the surgeries um, but that'll i'll save that for the end um, all right, in this video um, is going to be a hodgepodge. It's it's just basically an update video. I'm going to do some announcements. Um, I'm going to make a couple of observations about some stuff I've seen over the last month and a half. I'm going to talk a little bit about where we are right now as a community and where are we going. So for those of you, you know, those of you who watch our content on YouTube, LinkedIn, um, those of you who are members of the Discord server or at IoT.University, kind of. What are the things we're working on? What is the stuff that you can expect in 2024? I'll talk a little bit about where I'm speaking between now and like June. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some just interesting developments uh, with my organizations. Like uh, I, can't, I won't mention the companies we're working with, but I'll talk about some of the stuff that we're doing that I find uh, just incredibly fascinating and they are indicative of where the market is going. All right. So with that, I'll, I, I want you to. I want to ask you to bear with me. Um, I may not be as clear and concise in this video as I have uh, that I typically as I typically am, and the reason why is, and part of the reason I haven't shot any content is because of my medical emergency. Um, one of the side effects of what I went through, uh, I've been suffering from brain fog. And I'm going to talk a little bit. Actually, I'll just tell you right now. It, normally, for me, the part, the reason that I haven't been posting on LinkedIn and I, we haven't been shooting videos is I do these videos um, off the cuff. So right now, what's in front of me is just a series of bullet points and a couple of screenshots. That's it. Um, I, I normally don't shoot a video with even that. Uh, and then I just do a stream of consciousness from my brain. Um, if any of you have ever played chess... Um, and I assume a lot of our audiences play chess. Um, in my normal life, I am generally looking somewhere like five, six moves ahead, sometimes seven, eight moves ahead. So I can, I in my head, I can see a big whiteboard and I see bulleted lists and I can create a mind map um, stream of consciousness. That's what I normally see when people ask, like, how do you shoot these videos? I'm, I'm, that's how my brain operates. So I can see permutations out to six, seven, eight levels. So I can see hundreds of options based on a series of cascaded decisions, permutated decisions in my brain normally. Uh, it, just like in chess, if you look at the best chess, the grandmasters, they, they're looking 15 moves ahead. Uh, right, right now, I can only see one or two in my brain. I can only deal with the thing that's directly in front of me or maybe – the consequence of the thing that's directly in front of me. And that is a function of the anesthesia when I, uh, the surgery I went through, and also the fact that my body has been using basically all of its energy, not in my brain, but <laughs> to like heal my body. Okay. So, anyway, I, j I just want to ask you to bear with me. This video is actually f uh, practice for me um, because I have a series of videos I need to shoot this week. I'm going to be teaching Mastermind on Friday. This video should be going live. Monday, February 5th. I'm actually shooting it Monday, February 5th, and it should go out uh, on Twitter, LinkedIn, and on YouTube all at the exact same time. All right, so let's talk about um, some announcements. For those of you in the community, uh, those of you at IoT.University who are in Mastermind, our next session is this Friday, February 9th, um, and we're going to be talking about big data. Uh, we're going to be doing a lesson on Snowflake. 
uh, that session, that mastermind session this Friday is, um, we won't be just be talking about Snowflake. I'm actually going to be doing um, a couple of other smaller lessons related to high bite. Um, or we're going to talk about some stuff that's going on um, with Litmus, some stuff that's going on at Hive MQ. Um, we're going to be talking about some things about MQTT in general and how we take MQTT topical namespaces and how we take the format of those topical namespaces and we structure them for time series databases or for NoSQL databases. And the reason we're going to do that is because on Friday, we're going to show how to architect um, a connection from your unified namespace into Snowflake. Um, mentors, that's going to be 8 o'clock, 8 a.m. Central Friday, normal time. Uh, it only go about two hours right now. I don't think, A, I have trouble sitting, and B, um, I don't think I can go much longer than two hours. But uh, we've scheduled it for three. If I can go three hours and answer questions longer, I will. Um, but uh, right now the plan is we'll try and keep it to a two-hour session um, Friday. There is a video, um, a separate video that is a background on Snowflake that I'll be shooting this week. Uh, so that I don't have where I would normally do that in Mastermind, I'll shoot that video separately and we'll upload it into the Mastermind portal, um, hopefully before the session. Uh, mentorship is next Friday, <coughs> excuse me, February 16th at 9 a.m. And we will also be doing a big data lesson. Um, it, it's a, a smaller lesson, but I'm going to be talking about like engineers with engineers on like the considera considerations for taking industrial data that's been unified with both IT and OT events and, you know, the considerations, you, what you need to take into consideration to, to stream that into a data lake or a data warehouse. What is a data lake and what is a data warehouse also? Um, a couple of other announcements. Um, my next speaking engagement is gonna be on LinkedIn. It is actually being put on by Flexware Innovation. I've told the story a bunch of times about who Flexware is. They're a premier integrator based in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, my relationship with Flexware goes back, I think, like to 2016. We um, there was a guy who used to work there. They were they were primarily a big bulk of their business. I think I think they're a member. They're they're partnered with Hitachi now. I think they're actually a subsidiary of Hitachi. I may be wrong, but I, I think that's what it is. Hitachi, I think Hitachi bought them. And uh, they were primarily in life sciences. Um, and they were uh, working with other, you know, with uh, more off-the-shelf MES platforms. One of their guys came to us, was very interested in the UNS and using working with Ignition. And, and I worked with um, um, Flexware Innovation to kind of, you know, convince them to – really take Ignition um, serious. Met with Scott Whitlock there, one of their founders. Uh, they went out to ICC that year in 2016. And I think within a year, they were like a, a premier integrator. They've been doing tons of training in the Midwest. Part of the reason that we, we engaged with them was there was a big vacuum in the Midwest. And because there was a lot of legacy companies really driving manufacturing in Indiana and Illinois and, and uh, Michigan. And there weren't a lot of organizations using um, bleeding edge technology or, or open platforms. And um, Flexware has played a huge role in educating uh, manufacturers in the Midwest. On They, they have a, a lab there where they do trainings, and they've played a huge role there. They are putting on a, uh, a live stream event on February 21st at 1 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, called Engineering the Future, Exciting Paradigms, Driving the Manufacturing Innovation. Myself, Jen Winter, Galad Longer from Tulip, and Isaac Bennett will be sitting on a panel that is uh, moderated by Dwayne Butcher. Um, you can go to LinkedIn. I think it'll be in the description below, the LinkedIn, uh, the LinkedIn to sign up for it. Um, there's already a ton of people who have, who have signed up for it, but uh, I strongly encourage you to sign up for that. Again, February 21st at one o'clock Eastern, we'll have the link down below. Um, I also, uh, the next speaking engagement after that is gonna be March 4th, which is um, actually one of my son's birthdays. Uh, I'll be at IFPAC in, in Washington, DC, um, speaking there. And then uh, 10 days later, I will be doing a, I'll be speaking at PMI, uh, the Dallas chapter on March 14th, 
And interestingly, it's uh, I'm actually I think I'm going to be speaking at the country club I'm a member at. Uh, I think that's actually where it's going on, which is like literally right behind where my house is. Um, just how small the world is. And then uh, May 1st and 2nd, I will be doing a digital transformation forum in Boston. Um, and that is our announcements. Um, actually, I want to give a quick shout out. <clears throat> um, let me start off by saying I've been out of the loop for five, six weeks. Um, it, it was really rough going. I'll explain here in a little bit, like actually what happened to me and kind of why, why I've been gone. Um, but there are a couple of members of the community, four members of, the, of our community. Uh, by the way, thousands of people reached out and sent their well wishes and sent messages. And I'm incredibly grateful for all the people who reached out. I, I have promised myself and my team that I will personally respond to every single person who reached out with a well wish. That is our goal. Um, I hope that I'm going to be able to pull that off. But there are four people who are, who are members of the community who have gone above and beyond um, to uh, su support me and my team uh, during this time. It was really um, hard because I'm the face of IoT.University and 4.0 Solutions. Intellic integration really runs itself, and I'm not needed there. Near, I'm only need to be need to be there for board meetings. But um, 4.0 Solutions and IoT.University, I'm the face of the of um, those companies as well as Full Strength.ai. <coughs> IoT.University is not a company; it's a platform. And uh, I just want to say thank you. You know who you are. Uh, who I, you know, one one member in particular of the community was messaging me. You know, while I was in the hospital and, you know, giving words of encouragement and, and words of support, but also kind of understanding what I was going through physically and kind of keeping me in the loop as to what was going on um, in the community. But four of you, um, I, I, I just want to say thank you um, to you and you know who you are. A, a couple of um, observations that I, I want to make um, before we move on to the kind of where we are right now and where are we going and what the plan is for the year. I'm going to, if I have time, I'm going to answer a couple of questions um, from YouTube comments. I'm going to try and keep this video to 30 minutes. Uh, we're at um, 12 minutes right now. So <laughs> I don't know if that's going to happen. Um, number one, first and foremost, obviously unified namespace has exploded. Uh, it's everywhere. Go on LinkedIn and Google Unified Namespace, um, it's everywhere. Um, there are videos everywhere. There are blog posts. There are um, um, lots of LinkedIn posts about Unified Namespace. Uh, HiveMQ, Kutsai has been doing a bunch of awesome stuff around um, UNS. I have not kept up with everything, so I can't a lot of people have reached out and asked me, "Hey Walker, what do you think about this? Can you, you know, did they get it right, or did they get it right here?" I haven't had a chance to go through those requests. I will, um, but um, what I will say is that UNS has exploded, as you can tell. Um, and I, I wanted to talk about my observation on whether UNS is here to stay. First off, first and foremost, um, it absolutely is. There's a, if you guys aren't a member of the Discord server, there's an, a great, I want to say thank you to Matt Paris who pointed out pointed out to me last night um, this thread in in Discord about, you know, sort of a debate going back and forth on OPC UA and MQTT, which we talk about all the time. You know, there was obviously a, an update to part 14 of OPC UA pub sub, which we will be talking about in a later video. I'm not going to get into it here, but um, that's kind of a game changer. Um, doesn't really change where OPC UA lives inside of a unified namespace, um, like where it's appropriate in an architecture. OPC UA is really, it's, it's best suited for the edge. Um, this is probably the biggest problem with uh, Azure IoT's approach to architecture, um, primarily because, you know, and it's, it, I, I really blame Eric Barnstead for this, but, um, you know, o OPC UA does not, there's no, by the way, there is no organization, I wanna say this real quick, there is literally not a single example of an organization who has digitally transformed, that is gotten to the point where they are ready to plug into a digital supply chain, where OPC UA is the foundation of their infrastructure. 
um, they they hit a critical mass and scale, and they have to pivot. It happens every single time. It's never not happened. Uh, there is no example of an OPC UA infrastructure. This is why Azure had to, um, they literally had to, I mean, they, they fucking fired 10,000 people because poor le leadership led them down the OPC UA path. No matter what you do with current technology, the sheer, the three primary fundamental issues with OPC UA as it relates to be as an IoT protocol is one, verbosity. There are elements and headers. There are architectural decisions that were made with how clients and servers communicate with one another. There are limitations in the subscription model in the standard that make, that make um, what passes over the wire more verbose than it needs to be. Okay, number two, um, it was built, it was, the standard was originally written at a time where pull response was the primary infrastructure. They have never gone back to the drawing board. In fact, part 14 pub sub is a bastardization. It was, it's literally a, a, a monkey patch for a dated um, protocol, IoT protocol strategy. Uh, um, that's number two. And number three, it is the politics. It is the, the OPC foundation struggles to focus on efficiency and optimal. Um, what they're constantly focused on is what is best for the largest members, you know, Beckoff, Microsoft, et cetera, of the foundation. And so what you end up with is, is 80% of the standard is optional. Um, the, the barrier to entry to use OPC UA is so high that a lot of it doesn't get implemented. I mean, there, there are, I mean, Matt Paris is famous for this. You know, he'll just say, show me. He'll say, show me it implemented. You know, I, I mean, I know you're showing it me in the standard, but show it to me implemented. And there are just so many examples of features written into the specification that are, I mean, if we, I, it would be interesting if we did a heat map of the specification. We did a heat map of, and, and showed the places that were really cold. That would be the places in the specification that haven't been leveraged relative to the places that have been re leveraged. Those would be red, blue and red. That would be really awesome, actually, to do. Anyway, there was a big discussion going about on NKTT and OPC UA, and what I wanted to say about my observations here is I think people are starting to understand how NKTT and OPC UA work together to create interoperability in an open infrastructure. And that, I mean, that is a, a fundamental observation that I've made over the last couple of months. Um, so UNS is here to stay. It's exploded. And MQTT, the MQTT crowd and the OPC UA crowd, uh, I'm a, I happen to be on both sides of the argument. We use OPC UA all the time. We use it on edge and then we use protocol conversion, primarily using high bite. Um, we did, we actually showed how to do that in December's, um, sessions for mentorship and mastermind. Um, we do protocol conversion generally using a data ops platform like high bite. That's the one we use or ignition. <coughs> um, it, people are starting to understand how they interoperate with one another, okay? Um, here's another observation. This is, yeah, I gotta be careful here. Um, two things. Number one, we get a lot of questions. Uh, actually, there's a YouTube comment where someone was asking, hey, can you show us an example of um, a UNS that does X, Y, or Z? Um, the answer is, is that, that we can always do that if someone is willing to sign a non-disclosure agreement that is, has the, at least has the minimum restrictions of the non-disclosure agreement we have with our clients. Those of you who work in digital transformation know that your clients don't want you showing their data, their infrastructure, really to anyone. I mean, it, we have a couple of clients who agreed up front that we could basically show their infrastructure to anyone who wasn't in their industry. Okay, so like, for example, we have a client here in Dallas that is our model facility. Uh, we show their UNS all the time in many examples. We have a, um, a client based in San Antonio who is in um, the water wastewater industry. We show their infrastructure all the time, but we can't show them, can't show it to anyone who's in water wastewater, right? And we can't show for the client who's here in Dallas, we can't show it to anyone who's in the printing or the flexible packaging industry, right? 
So we have a couple of clients who allow us to show, and then and then on a case by case basis. So like we work with one of the big sugar water manufacturers, <laughs> the big global one, um, one of the big global ones. Uh, we can show like one off. You know, hey, uh, we get permission at a time to show. Um, maybe we can show a reference architecture, or they'll they'll have to go and sanitize it, or we can actually show a live unified namespace. We have clients in the life sciences industry who, by the way, are becoming much more agreeable to allowing us to share what their architectures look like and, and show people what their live data looks like, as long, again, as long as we're not showing someone who's in the life sciences industry. One of the things that we're doing as an organization this year is we have case studies that we've been working on. Right now we have five of them lined up. Um, three of them will include machine learning applications. All five of those um, case studies that we will be coming out with this year will be sanitized so you'll know the industry and then we will obfuscate the actual data points, but they will be obfuscated in a way where you will understand actually how it's architected architect and how it works and then what the actual outcomes were. What were the business outcomes? Here was the problem, here was the cost, here was the cost of the solution, and here was the yield on the back end. Um, all five of those are very mature digital transformation initiatives, that is, they are at the point where they're doing, three of them at least are doing ML and AI, um, two of which are already plugged into digital supply chains, okay? So that's part of our uh, plan for this year, but it came from an observation, which was the community has gotten to the point where they, you know, they want to get more technical. And I want to talk about um, our content, and I want to ask you guys a couple of questions about um, maybe the direction we should go with um, our channel. Uh, there was a video I, I watched with my sons the other day, this guy called Styro Pyro. <clears throat> you can look him up on YouTube. He's a young kid. I think he's a physicist, maybe a chemist. But he does a lot of stuff with electrical. And he shot this video called, What is it that makes electricity lethal? Or, what's, or is, it, is it really current that makes electricity lethal? And then he proceeds to go in, a, in that video for 30 or 40 minutes in a very technical capacity, arguing the nuances of electricity um, for a very broad audience. The audience on YouTube is a very, very broad audience. You have 15-year-old kids who watch our videos, and you have 60-year-old engineers with 40 years of experience watching videos on YouTube. We, have a, we understand that. And so when we produce a video for YouTube, we're either talking directly to our community or we are talking to a very broad vector audience. And then we speak to the seventh grade level on YouTube. Okay, we, do, we generally do not get very technical in the content on YouTube. Even with the whiteboard videos, which we've gotten a little bit more technical, you will notice that technical videos underperform. And the reason why is because they are above the head of, or they are, they, they, they don't speak to a broad audience. The Styro Pyro guy shot a video that was really meant, that really was for appropriate for those who, uh, students of BSEE programs um, or electrical engineers or uh, those with advanced engineering degrees. So when he was arguing that Ohm's law doesn't always apply, well, what he was doing, what, what he didn't understand when he was saying this in his video, that Ohm's law isn't really a law, it doesn't always apply, he failed to understand because he's not an electrical engineer that Ohm's law is a law in properly engineered circuits, that is properly specified circuits. When a circuit goes outside of an specif the specification of how that, that circuit was engineered, then there are scenarios where the, the result of the, um, let's say the, the inrush current exceeding the specification may get to a point where um, the insulation on a conductor uh, vaporizes, and then the carbon makes that that uh, insulation conductive and no longer insulative, and therefore Ohm's law goes out the window. Well, it never goes out of the window in a properly engineered circuit. Um, now, those of you who are electrical engineers understand what I just said, and you understand the nuance, but a person who's with the seventh grade audience hears Ohm's law is not a law. He did a whole lesson on talking about, I mean, really, like it was a very irresponsible video. It, it is likely going to get one of his 
viewers killed because Heinrich's accident triangle shows us that, you know, if if someone walks away from his video and thinks of, hey, electricity isn't nearly as dangerous to people as it says, and it's not current that kills me, which is his argument, then you will have more at-risk behaviors, and more at-risk behaviors will lead to more uh, near misses, and more near misses will lead to more first aids, and more first aids will lead to more lost time accidents, and more lost time accidents will lead to more fatalities. That's just the way it works. Um, Heinrich's accidents tri triangle is a behavioral sciences law. Uh, we try to keep our YouTube content to a very broad audience, and we try to be very responsible about what we say, okay? Then when you go to IOT.University or Discord, or so if you go to Mentorship, Mastermind, or any of our workshops, we, we know the credentials of the people who are taking those courses. And they are, high, they are highly specified. So they are much more technical discussions. So whether it's a, you know, the IoT Minute, whether it's a free offering or whether it's something, you know, community supported like mentorship or mastermind or a workshop, we are much more technical in those discussions because we know who, we know the people we are talking to. We don't know who's going to watch a YouTube video. And there's a second piece here. In a YouTube video, we have to be, we have to craft our YouTube channel in a way where YouTube's algorithm will promote if we want to have the biggest reach and we want to affect change and we want to save and create middle-class jobs through affecting that change, which is through the promotion of digital transformation, we have to have the biggest reach. And so what we can't do is produce videos that underperform, which deprioritize us in the YouTube algorithm. <coughs> so with that being said, we want to get more technical with a broad audience. Right now, I'm gonna, one of the announcements I was going to make. Let's talk about what our total uh, audience is here. So our total audience, let me, um, unique people who watched our videos, any video that we produced in um, 2023, we had more than 100,000 unique people watch one of our videos. Okay, more than 100,000. Um, we have 13,000 people are in IIoT.University. Of that 13,000 people, um, a little over 1,200 have paid for some product in there that supports all of the production that we do. So the, all the free content we do on YouTube, all the free content we do on LinkedIn, all of the free workshops that we have at IoT.University moderating and managing the Discord server, uh, my speaking events. Uh, half the speaking events I did last year, we did for free. And, if, and, it, and we did it because we, want, we wanted to support the community. There's basically 1,200 people in the community who support all the things we do. There are 13,000 who benefit from the investment of those 1,200, okay? One of the things that we want to do, and, and, and we want to give away as much as we can for free. So one of the things that we've talked about doing, and I, I'd like for you to comment down below on this. We are currently working on writing a technical test, um, a basically a technical test that is going to test fluency. It would be your fluency um, at IoT.University on Industry 4, the Industrial Internet of Things, Digital Transformation, and Unified Namespace on those four things, okay? And, and subsets would be more um, the, the technical sub-elements of each of those four pillars. Uh, we, would write, we would write the test. People would go to IoT.University. They would take that test. And if they got over a certain score, um, a, a aggregate score, then they would be added into a list of people who would receive links to free technical videos that we would either publish unlisted on YouTube or we would publish them on the IoT University platform. It's, it's the only stuff that we do that we charge for, the only videos we charge for are the ones that cost us a lot of money to produce. So like Mastermind, when I do a two to four hour session on Mastermind, it takes 40 hours to put together uh, everything required to teach 40 man hours to teach that. So when you take all of our staff, sometimes it's 100 or 200 hours that goes into that. And we have 
um, you know, I, I mean, I think Travis was telling me we have we have some videos that cost us forty thousand dollars to produce in man hours. I mean, literally, uh, there are some lessons there. Are, we, I mean, we had a workshop that cost us a hundred thousand dollars. Like our cost to do the workshop was a hundred thousand dollars. So <coughs> that's the only reason we charge for anything that is of um, a heavy lift. So what we would do is we would have this fluency test. You could take the test, and if you got past a, a certain grade, a certain level, aggregate score, then you would be a, you would be uh, added to a list that would receive links to these technical presentations. Um, nothing else would change. It would just be another another level of content that we produce that's more technical. It's more technical than what we would put on YouTube. But it's it's a, a lesson that would not be included. It's a lesson that we wouldn't necessarily dedicate an entire mentorship or mastermind session to or a workshop to or the level of effort for us to do that technical lesson. It would be like I'm going to the whiteboard and I'm shooting a 45-minute video and I'm doing it stream of consciousness and it's a technical discussion. So that is our total investment in producing that video is an hour and 15 or, you know, no more than two hours. That's something we can just give to the community for free, but that's not something we would put on YouTube. And we want to make sure that whoever has access to that video is somebody who we have vetted their technical chops. We want to be responsible. Okay. Because there are assumptions we make in technical videos. When I'm teaching mastermind, I know the level of the people I'm teaching. So I know that I'm not going to say something to someone that is going to ha uh, based on their education and their experience, they will not draw an incorrect incorrect conclusion that will lead to a bad outcome. Okay? Um so let me know what you think about that. It, it, we're already working on it, but we want comment down below, is that a good idea? Is it a good idea to measure digital fluency? And if and and for those who have digital fluency above a eighty percent threshold on this four pillar test, that we they would then have access to this this free technical content that everyone keeps asking for. Okay, all right. Let me talk about a couple of where are we goings, um, and then um, and then I'll tell you kind of where I've been. So where are we now? So real quick, where are we now? We have. Um, about between, uh, it looks like we have about 800 members in Mastermind and Mentorship. The Mastermind mentor, uh, membership has exploded. Um, we're at a point now where we've been doing Mastermind three and a half years. Our churn rate is still really low. I think it's under 10%, which is that's your goal, 10%. Uh, that means every year you want night, you know, night, you know that you're producing good content if 90% uh, renew. A couple of observations that we're seeing. Here's a, a big one that stands out. In the beginning, the vast majority of people who were in Mastermind were paying for Mastermind themselves. The if you look at the new the last 100 signups in Mastermind, the vast majority are um, they're being paid by their companies. Um, the economy is definitely getting tough. Like all, the, don't believe the stuff that you see on the news about the strength of the economy. Uh, there is no way that that is, that they're, they're cooking the books there. Um, manufacturing dictates the health of our economy. And, um, you know, a lot of people are losing their jobs. Uh, a lot of the job postings that are on Indeed and um, they're not real, they're fake. We actually found out through uh, an agency that we work with that uh, a lot of companies are putting job postings um, on job boards, but there's actually no opening. Those job postings are only there for investors. It's for investors, investors who are deciding whether or not they want to invest in a company. They are going and, and you know, they see, oh, they're, they're hiring all these people and they're looking at their turnover rate. Oh, it's low. They're adding and, but they're actually not hiring anyone. We actually found that out through a recruitment agency that that's what's going on. Um, so, the economy is is rough, and I it, it's still going to get worse. I mean, um, you know, d just based on, um, 
you know, the value of the dollar and inflation, et cetera. But um, so we're trying to figure out how to ease that burden on the community. And we're working on ways to do that in this, you know, the, the, what I just talked about previously is, is one of those ways. So we have about 800 or so in mentorship and mastermind continues to grow low churn rate. Um, we added, I can't remember. They, they sent me the number, but if you look at the total number of our, our channel growth, the total number of people who, who came into discord, you know, we have 13,000 people at IOT university. That is 13,000 students. We have in Discord, we have 6,300 people in Discord. And I think Josh told me there are every two weeks, 1,500 people engage, 1,500 different unique people engage. Um, the biggest challenge with the Discord server is there is so much information there. There is so much content there. there uh, any new person who comes to discord has got to take some time to get acclimated got to ask people in the community how to find what they're looking for and if you know how to use discord to uh their search features you can you can find like the keywords you're looking for um our, our linkedin following has absolutely exploded okay and then i want to talk about one one last thing before kind of where we're going over the last three months four months, we have been hired by a couple of the big cloud providers um, to completely, to consult with them on completely rebuilding their um, industry offerings, okay? I, I, later in the year, I'm going to get to talk about this more. I will say that the, the, these are groundbreaking moves, okay? Um, these are the names that everybody knows, Um and they are, they're changing everything. Okay. Why? Because of UNS. Um, the, we are working with many OEMs on products that they have coming out um, to make sure that their offerings are going to fall in line with what the industry needs. Um, and I have received a couple of um, so I want to say this thing. There is no such thing as privacy anymore. There, the idea that you can control the message is ridiculous. Okay. Like Microsoft last year, when they came out with their new Azure IoT, six months before they announced it, that had been leaked to me by two dozen people. Okay, the, the new IoT architecture with the OPC UA self-discovery browser and their broker, the E4K broker. Um, you know, that pissed off Eric Barnstead and he, you know, violation NDA and blah, 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 blah. And my all I was thinking was, how what may like you what makes you think that that would remain private? Like we have one of the one of the um industry four companies. I don't even want to say what product they make has, you know, I received this long email plus a bunch of documents about the new direction of this Industry 4 company, okay? This Industry 4 company has decided because there's a new competitor coming in that's going to really hurt their market. They have decided that they are going to become a enterprise company only. They're going to go to the boardroom and try to sell their product only in the boardroom from the top down. Right now, as you know them, if I say their name, they are a bottom-up company. They are doing small OT projects and POCs, and they're trying to go ground up. But this, and and that's the vast majority. They they do high pressure sales, but they're, you know, because they need the capital. But they're they're going top down, and I don't blame them because I don't think if they if they don't take that step and try to chase six and seven figure opportunities that they're going to last in the market very long because there's an emerging competitor that's going to really kill them. I mean, or at least kill their their current offering. So I don't blame the approach that they're taking. But what I'm saying is, is that there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes that I will talk about in later videos. The the cloud platform stuff I'm going to get to talk about. Uh, I th I'll be the first one to get to announce it. And I think it's like going to be in August. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. And all of it is going in the direction of what this community has said we should be doing. Right, and I a, a lot of the feature requests for the MQTT specification are being built by OEMs right now, 
And so, and that and that is the power of this community. The, this community, the Industry Four community, is who is who's making that happen. Okay, um, so thank you, <laughs> first and foremost. Um, all right, what I will say is this: is that in 2023, we'll talk about this when I do the podcast with John Harrington, which we were scheduled to do in the beginning of January. Uh, we're going to talk about what was 2023 look like. What is 2024 going to look like? Uh, I'll talk about some some more of the hard numbers um, in terms of LinkedIn engagement. You know, the number of you know we've done. You know, we have a hundred thousand followers across all platforms. Last year, I did nine speaking engagements, which is the most I've done in any year. I don't. It normally takes me a month to prep a speaking engagement. Um, we just had a a huge impact last year. Let me um, go over here. To well, let me not do that. Um, you know, thirteen thousand students. Um, total number of views. I can't remember what we did. Um, it was a lot. It was a uh, it was a seven figure number on YouTube content. Um, you know, it's, it's crazy. I mean, if you think about it, this was, a this started with a whiteboard video in 2018 where Zach tricked me into doing this whiteboard video. Uh, that's one of the things that's happening this year. We're going to bring Zach back and, uh, on the podcast. Um, and it's grown into this huge, huge community. And that's just, a you know, the, the impact this community has had is, um, profound. Let's talk about a little bit about where we're going. Um, mastermind and mentorship curriculum for 2024 for the next six months is completed. We will. I'm going to announce that curriculum for the mastermind and mentorship students uh, this Friday and next Friday. So kind of what we're talking about. We're going to have a discussion about Virtual Factory and bringing it back. A lot of questions have at, people have asked me about Virtual Factory. There were only about six people who were doing all the work. All the students were benefiting from the, the work those six students were doing. But only about six people were doing the work for Virtual Factory. Um, and so we decided that wasn't fair or optimal. And there were some things that developed midway through last year where we needed to pivot our educational focus. So we hit a pause on Virtual Factory. We will be bringing it back in 2024. We have an ML and AI workshop that's coming up. Uh, Josh didn't put the date here. I don't know if it's March, April, probably April, I would think. Um, and then also, I'm actually going to be doing a book review. So I have my UNS handbook uh, ready to release. Uh, once I chip away at all these messages that came in, uh, we'll get the UNS handbook out. I think it'll it'll explain more clearly for the community. Uh, I think it'll answer a lot of questions that the community asks through YouTube and that kind of stuff. Um, and it'll also give the community a resource to filter out who they should listen to and who they should not listen to. But uh, somebody asked, sent me a book um, and asked me to review it. And it's on Arduino IoT Cloud. Uh, I will be doing a review of this book. I actually just got it. Um, I just started reading it. It's pretty thick, so I'm trying to get through all of it. I'll have that book review out in the next couple of weeks. And then um, a couple of the large uh, AI companies have reached out to us. And we actually just negotiated a deal today with one of the big AI companies um, to where we're going to be able to offer their services to the community and we're going to, and they're going to support us in doing training on, and this one will fucking blow your mind. And our, here's our goal here. One of the models is in its infancy, but um, what we want to be able to do is take uh, generative AI, okay, we want to be able to take a LLM, something like ChatGPT, and we want to be able to output charts and reports using, um, you know, something like Dolly, okay? So we're, they're creating, we're using AI to also create uh, the image uh, rather than having um, something like ChatGPT create the data set that then the report builder is consuming to generate. What we want to do is just be able to use AI to generate the actual report that does exist, believe it or not, it actually works. Um, and I'll be reviewing that with one of the large AI companies here shortly. All right, with that, <clears throat> the, what I need you to do before I kind of explain where I've been, most of you will want to drop off here, but those of you who want to know kind of where I've been and 
what the status is with me. I'm going to talk about that here in a second. Um, comment down below on the fluency test, the digital fluency test. Whether is that a good idea? Should we invest our time in that? Um, I and and is that a good idea for um, quantifying the fluency of the audience for uh, you know technical content where I'm I'm you know technical whiteboard content like re, you know nuts and bolts uh, where maybe a question is going to come in on Walker how to do this here's the actual problem I have can you show me how to build this and if I can do that in 45 minutes or less then that's not something that needs to be part of a paid program, right? Um, you know, if I can engineer something in 45 minutes or less, then it doesn't, it doesn't need to be supported by the community. And, and I think right now that's a gap in our content. It'd be really helpful if you put that comment down below. All right, now with that, let me kind of explain where I've been and what's my status. Uh, all right, so what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about what happened to me and uh, what my status is, where I've been, and then I want to talk about how my experience, um, what did I learn about digital transformation in our everyday lives through this experience. So here's what happened. Most of you know that I'm a power lifter, so I, um, I train a lot, about 25 hours a week, um, and I own a company called FullStrength.ai where we built a vision system that uses technology we use in industry to help athletes get better. And we've been using that vision system and working with some of the best strength athletes in the world. Uh, you guys may have seen the video with me and Brian Shaw. We're a two-time sponsor of the Shaw Classic. We're actually be a three-time sponsor. We actually meet with Brian later this week to finalize our investment in the Shaw Classic in Love and Colorado in August. I am a power lifter. Um, so basically what happened was after Christmas, I, I went on what's known as deload. Uh, deload is something we generally do every six or eight weeks in our training where we don't, where we greatly reduce the amount of weight we're lifting to give our body time to recover. There's two different ways to do that. One way is to, um, you just reduce your weight. Like say if I'm, I'm lifting 200 pounds whenever I do a bench press, uh, maybe that week, all I do is lift hundred pounds. I don't go above hundred pounds. I reduce it by 50. And then there's another deload, which is called just a, a conventional deload, where I actually take the whole week off, and that's what I did. So the first thing that that got me into trouble was I did a full deload. So I, I, my family and I traveled uh, after Christmas, and I, we didn't train at all for eight days. So I didn't do any training. The second thing that I happened was I had what is known as uh, diverticulitis, which I didn't know I had. Uh, there's basically these little sacs inside your large intestine going into the colon, um, and those sacs can become infected. It's not common, but it can happen. Uh, most of the time, a sac will become infected. It will grow. It'll be like kind of like an abscess, and it can it'll burst. Now, if it bursts and it just stays inside of your um, intestines, then you would just, you might just feel sick. Uh, you might get diarrhea, you might, you know, but, and, and it might heal on its own and you may never know anything happened or it could burst and it could perforate the, um, intestine or the colon. And that means that all that nasty stuff leaks into your body. And that's a bad thing. It gets into your blood. And, um, well, what happened to me was I had two of them and they were both, they were like maybe six inches apart inside of my intestine. I came back from deload, and on Tuesday, so it'll be, I think it's a, a month ago tomorrow, um, I came back from deload, and I did a training session. And in that training session, well, during the time I was on deload, the infection in my diverticula got worse. Um, I trained. I did a heavy workout. It caused both of the diverticuli to burst and both of them perforated. So what I ended up with was um, like all this poison that leaked out into my body, got into my blood. Within a couple of hours of me working out, I was in, I had this horrible abdominal pain. And um, I mean, I had a fever, I had this horrible abdominal pain, but I couldn't tell if it was like indigestion. You know, I mean, I'm a tough guy, like I'm big. So I waited to see if it would get worse. I was around four o'clock in the afternoon. 
it, it didn't get any worse over the next four hours. So by like eight o'clock, um, I said to, my kids and I sat down and said, I'm going to go to bed. I'm going to go take a hot shower. I'm going to go to bed. I had one of my sons sleep in my bedroom. Um, and I said, if it gets any worse, we'll go to the hospital. So while we do this, why don't we go and let's pick the hospital that I'll go to if this happens. We got our health insurance all in order and all, you know, we picked the hospital. And one of the things I was looking for in the hospital was a, it was close. It had a high rating, but also that it was a digital hospital. One of the things I was looking for was a hospital that doesn't use like paper records and I'd be able to see my chart myself through a, like an online portal. And we picked one of those hospitals. One o'clock in the morning, I was in excruciating pain. I woke my son up, my who was sleeping in my room, and all of us went to the hospital. I went to the ER. Uh, they did a CAT scan. They you know did all these tests. They gave me painkillers, and they called the internist who came into the hospital, the surgeon, and he told me what was going on. He said, "You have diverticulitis." They both perforated. Um, you are septic. So basically, my blood was poisoned. Uh, your kidneys have stopped working. I had a acute renal failure. Um, and we have to try and reverse that. And then we have to give you surgery. Um, that's when I, when they admitted me into the hospital, the first thing that happened, that happened on Tuesday. Tuesday by eight o'clock or by six in the morning, I'm on a bunch of an intravenous antibiotics. Um, and what they were trying to do was get the infection under control. Um, I went on a liquid diet where they were just putting IV fluids in me. Um, and then they just basically had me passed out with painkillers because it was excruciating. Um, it took two days for them to have the infection under control enough. My kidneys still were not operating. My blood was... Um, septic but they were they were basically taking my blood work every day every morning um and it took two days before i was stable enough so they could give me surgery and the surgery was pretty brutal they literally i have a scar in my abdomen like this big and it goes down i mean they literally just cut wherever the fuck they had to and then they cut out a huge section of my large intestine and colon and then they put them back together and they had to cut the section out because I had two – they burst in two places. And they had to basically take the good tissue and put it together. And then from there forward, it was a waiting game to see if my kidneys would start working again and if the sepsis would uh, go away. Um, by Saturday, two days after the surgery, things were looking really good. And um, – I spent several days in the ho I spent three or four more days in the hospital and I was discharged on Tuesday, which is when I sent you guys the video on Twitter and LinkedIn to give you the update. The what I've been doing over the last three weeks is um, healing and trying to recover from that surgery. I did not find out until uh, Monday when my surgeon came back in to take a look at me. He did not tell me how serious things were until Monday. Um, in fact, I did not know I had acute renal failure until I saw my own chart. So they gave me a login so that I could go on their portal and I could actually see every note that every, so every doctor that came and saw me, you know, disease specialists, a, a lot of them came, saw me, um, I could see when they would write their notes, they would pop up in my chart and I could read what they said. One of the things I noticed was a lot of them would say that they did things that they didn't actually do. Um, like, oh, I, I uh, took the patient's vitals or, you know, there were a couple of doctors who never even touched me, but they did come in and talk to me and ask me questions. But I would be able to read their charts and uh, read what they wrote. And, and um, my surgeon actually wrote in there the, the acute adrenal failure and then like how many hours my kidneys had not been functioning and, and what the functioning function level was, which was zero. So they were 0% function and, you know, it was like uh, – 79 hours or something is is what he predicted <clears throat> and he told me on monday two things that i thought was really interesting so number one like uh if this if this had been pre like 1989 or pre 1988 uh that's not the surgery i would have gotten they would have removed my colon and i would have gotten a colostomy bag and i would have just walked around with a bag 
literally the rest of my life. I would have just had a bag uh, that my waste would have gone into. And number two, if I had gone to the hospital between four and eight hours later, they would not have been able to reverse the sepsis or the adrenal failure, and I likely would have not survived the um, the illness, which is kind of crazy. It, 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 it really, you know... Uh, I am fully aware of my mortality, but when you when you face something like that, it's you know, and you realize you dodged a bullet, um, and I don't know, it changes your mindset. So, um, so anyway, with that, I have been for the last uh, three weeks since I've been discharged from the hospital. I wasn't supposed to go back to work for like twelve weeks. Um, after a week, I, I wasn't cleared to even like go to the gym and I, I was cleared to walk but I wasn't cleared to like go to the gym but I just told my doctor I'm that's ridiculous I'm you know obviously I'm gonna train but I'll just take it really really easy so I've actually been lifting weights since um like a couple days after I was out of the hospital and now granted I was lifting very light weights but I was still training and it was because for me to overcome the mental experience. Um, the reason I tell you that is because I, I, we got thousands of messages and, you know, there's a big audience out there that it kind of expects me to post regularly and be on videos and not everybody sees the Twitter posts and not everyone sees the LinkedIn posts. Some people just watch on YouTube. And I, for those of you who are not aware of what actually happened, that's what happened. Where do I stand right now? Right now I feel about 70%. My brain, I feel like I can you know, instead of seeing six or seven, eight permutations down, I'm seeing like just the first two. I'm really, that's a concern for me. The doctors do tell me that'll go away. It's just like a brain fog caused by the anesthesia. And um, my body is so focused on healing, um, you know, down below. I mean, it's like, you know, the, the, you know, they had staples. I mean, it was, it's pretty gross, but in terms of what it, the scar looks like and stuff. Um, diverticulitis is no joke. I will say this, like I definitely learned, um, you know, when you have, uh, abdominal pain, you, especially if it's low, um, it's not like you don't feel it up in your chest at all, then you absolutely should not hesitate to at least call your doctor and tell them what you're feeling so that they can tell you where to go to the ER. Cause what I should have done if I could have gotten to the ER right after when right when I first started feeling the pain, which was within an hour of me training right after my workout where they both had burst, it took about an hour for me to start feeling the pain from the infection leaking out into my body. Um, if I had gone then, I may not have needed to be in the hospital for as long as I was. And I want to leave with this piece. Um, that seven days was $250,000 to save my life. Um, now, that's something I can afford. Like when I was a kid, I grew up obviously very poor, grew up in a trailer park. I have not always been wealthy. Um, I could afford to pay $250,000 out of pocket. I have my own insurance. And so I think the total amount that I'll have to pay is like, I think my deductible is $6,000. So... I can't pay more than $6,000. <clears> and one of the things that has stood out for me is, you know, I have, still have family members who are working class where a $6,000 bill would, like, bankrupt them. Um, and one of the things that I've really focused on, I've really thought about in this experience is how is it, how can our healthcare industry become more efficient, which will drive down costs, much in the same way that manufacturing becomes more and more efficient, which is dry, which is what drives down the cost of goods for um, consumers. And the answer is digital. Um, you know, I the hospital that I went to was owned by the doctors. One of the things that I did was I picked a hospital that wasn't owned by a corporation. We went by, we actually made a conscious choice. And this is a hospital that's owned by all of the doctors who work there. So when you become a doctor there, if you're not an adjunct, so there are two types of doctors. There are doctors who are, they literally work at that hospital, and then you have doctors that work externally 
who are adjuncts that they bring in for specialties. The doctors who actually work at the hospital own the hospital. They sit on a board of directors together, and then they hire the administrators, and they run the hospital. So, like, when you tell the doctor the nurse is not doing a good job, you're literally telling their boss, like their actual boss, the person who signs their paycheck. Um, because the doctors own the hospital, they were hyper-focused on innovation. Um, and the reason why is because since they're not administrators who are hired by bean counters, they it's literally like it's like taking the engineers and the production workers, the operations folks, the maintenance folks in a, in a manufacturer, and then giving them the decision-making power on what to do with the manufacturer. And you think about how you would innovate and how your focus would change. Um, the hospital that I went to did a absolutely phenomenal job. I didn't get permission to say their name, so I'm not going to say their name. If somebody asks me privately, I'll tell you who it is. Um, publicly, I will not say that unless I get the permission. But one of the things that I really took away from this is, is the way to bring down costs in healthcare is if we get wider adoption of digital tools across the healthcare industry. I mean, it was really crazy. You think about it, seven days, a quarter of a million dollars to save my life. And the only expensive machine I went into was a CAT, CAT scan. So it wasn't the equipment. The overhead of the equipment isn't the reason that my cost was high. Um, and I mean, and, and it was not lost on me. And I, I've thought long and hard about how we can take what we've done and we can help the healthcare industry improve in very much the same way. So I'll leave with this. If you have any ideas or comments, questions, concerns about how digital can make healthcare more accessible for all, uh, I'd love to see those in the comments down below. All right, with that, I've kept you long enough. Um, never intended to do an hour here. Um, thank you for watching. It's a it's a pleasure to be back. I've got a couple more videos that I'll be shooting this week. Like, subscribe, comment down below. Um, I've missed you all, and we'll see you in the next one.